AP Lit, and we're discussing the essay topics, and the first one is about sentimentality, and would you like to give us some answers? Yeah. Um, so, uh, define sentimental as of or promoted by feelings of tenderness, sadness, or nostalgia. What was that first word? Uh, sentimental as of or promoted by feelings of tenderness, sadness, or nostalgia. Of uh, or promoting? Is that what you mm -hmm. Promoted by. And... As a twin shows sentimentality through Huck, and how Huck is sentimental of Jim, and he always thinks of him, and his plans always end up like going to Jim, and how um, this, it, I don't know how to quite say it, like he, he always goes back to Jim, and, and he's more sentimental of who he is as a person, I guess. And, um, and then Before I Before you go on, I want, to, I want to modify this your definition. Remember, it's, it's an over, emotional response to things and so I would I would argue that towards Jim Huck he really ever sentimental but he has sentiments um, in other words I think he has a healthy he can show emotions he has emotions uh, he shows them some but I think what would really we're looking for are those people and maybe Huck does in places overdo it it's like nostalgia it's like a phone it's usually no it's always false at least the way we're using it. In other words, sentimentality are not genuine emotions. They're kind of uh, manipulated by something. So just keep that in mind. Okay. okay. Uh, did you have anything else? Um, I also just said that tw Twain is sentimental towards the Mississippi village life and how building a community requires optimism and the way he describes the setting. I feel like. But don't forget, we're, what we're going to be saying is that, that Twain, Huck Finn is Twain. You know, it's Mark Twain. Uh, incarnation, so to speak, of Mark Twain. Anyway, he uh, he he has respect for all these things, and he has a proper, he would say, proper emotional expression of it. But uh, I don't think there's any point in the book he ever, given the definition, it's over emotional. He never approves of that, and so just keep that in mind. What did you? What did um, you well, I said like Twain is obviously like a lot more practical like you can see that through how he has hug narrate things especially like deaths and stuff he just like breathes past them he doesn't like linger on them but one of the like interesting things that i noticed was that hook is able to like go to each of these places and spend like have like a significant event happen with a family and then just be completely fine leaving them like he has no attachment to these people and i just think that's interesting that they're like the he's not like sad to leave that's just, like talks about them and then never mentions. That's a good it. point, and that that through, that helps prove our point that he's not sentimental. But can you explain? You say he's practical. What's the practical explanation for why he he, he doesn't long? You know, he, he doesn't talk about Buck again. Doesn't talk about Emmeline again. Doesn't talk about Mary Jane again. What's the practical? Well, I know he he always says just like like when Buck dies, he said I cried, but then. I was fine because like grown-ups don't cry or something like that. It was just like it was just like over as soon as he showed emotion. And I think you could make a good case that it's not like so so much a principle of his. It's it's just the practical thing to do. He what's the number one thing he's trying to do here in the book, and he never loses sight of it. Well, occasionally when he gets in trouble, when he loses sight of it. What do you think the number one thing he and Jim are doing? What are they trying to do? Like laser focused most of the time on that. Like escape. Escape. And any, you know, he's not going to let Buck or Mary Jane or any of these experiences deter him from that. Although he does get deterred, distracted by the Tom Sawyer element. You know, let's go on this, let's go on this wrecked steamboat because Tom would. And so that that's not. He becomes somewhat sentimental when that happens. Yes. I think it's interesting that there's a fear break to that pattern. That like uh, these people, he, something happens to them and then he leaves. Except when Jim gets captured, because if the pattern isn't held true, it might have been like, all right, Jim's captured, time to move on. But instead, he just he stops and thinks about it, and he's like, no, I can't just walk away from him. And maybe that's because Jim's the only person who's ever really cared about him. I don't know, but it's just that he and Ashley left for Jim, but he can just walk away from everyone else. That's a, see how he. he Bill, that's really good, um, and it makes sense, and it's practical, and it's believable, uh, for, for very re maybe the very reasons that you just gave. Uh, he's the one exception to all that, and um, again, we, we have emotions, 
and we show them we have loyalties, um, but it's that it's that false kind that that gets us. I actually heard a guy, a preacher this morning on the radio, talking. He's talking about dating. Here it's five fifty in the morning. Been married forty five years. Why do I want to listen to a preacher talking about dating? He had some really interesting things to say, and um, he he called uh, the Hallmark. They, I forget, we didn't, it was a disparaging name, but it was you know, it was the false hallmark view of, of dating and relationships. Um, that just that's sentimental. Uh, the hallmark thing is borders on the sentimental, um, if not fully sentimental, as opposed to I don't know what what would be the what would be the opposite, not the opposite, but what would be a a reasonable romantic like Pride and Prejudice. I mean. It's, it's a period piece. I mean, it goes back to a period that we, we probably can't relate to anymore. Um, but there's, it, it seems real, you know, and it doesn't seem overly done. Anyway, uh, that was a really good, good point about how he's attached to this one person. We are emotional people. Anything else about sentiment? You didn't, nobody mentioned Emmeline. I think you couldn't answer this without looking at her. If I had time, I might have time. I haven't looked. I have... Um, some artwork that I'm sure I can find pretty easily to show you that that is the kind of thing Emmeline Grangerford did. And, and if you see it, maybe you can really, I get it now. I see why art, how artwork could be sentimental. Um, but uh, I don't think you could not mention her because see, she's the, she's the, uh, like the epitome um, uh, of, of sentimentalism. And don't forget the the crowds are sentimental. Don't forget Grangerford and Shepherdsons. Are they sentimental? Yes, because they it's not the tear jerking sentiment. I don't see them crying, but they they are they believe they, they lead with their emotions. And they they don't think. They just shoot and ask questions later. So violence is I think that's part of the question too, wasn't it? So that's the that's the next one. You see, they do kind of bleed with each other, but um, again, just think about the, the mobs, the groups that are all, um, and maybe we should go to the next one. Anybody want to do that one since we're kind of on it now? Talk about the violence and sentimentality. Karen, what, what did you say? We'll go to Avery, too. Um, I said that Twain is not a sport of violence, and this just shows because every time there is an instance of violence, pop is usually disgusted or sickened by what other people do. Good. Yeah, can you think of other examples uh, that come to your mind about that the connection? I mentioned your Granger friends <coughs> could be put in that. Yeah. Any other? There was the mob in um, the town with the colonel. Was that it? Uh, uh, Sherburn and Bob? Yes. Okay. He's a colonel too, isn't he? Yeah. I think Sherburn was a colonel, like Granger first was. But go ahead. But um, like when the mob, he kind of like took cover, Bob did. He took cover and just kind of sat back and watched it. He was kind of sickened by the fact that all these people were willing to kill this one man because he was stuck in what he said he was going to do. Um, and how they broke down his house and then Huck was he never gets involved in the violence. He always kind of sits back as like an observer of it and kind of judges the people off of it. Well, that, that's an interesting story if you think about it. Because Sherburn was absolutely wrong to kill a drunk, unarmed man in the street. But then the mob was absolutely wrong to try to lynch him they, that night. Uh, so there's nobody who's like, all oh, we think men. I mean, where's the good guy here? You almost start to admire Sherbert, even though he's a bloodthirsty killer, cold-blooded killer. Um, at least he's got some courage, you know, and, and yet it's really interesting. You, you don't want to like him, but you kind of do, yes. There's also not, well, not like the level of violence in all the others, when the uh, crowd is going to throw the, um, the stuff at the king and the duke. Yeah. And then they, like, just eventually get him. you know not the same group of people probably but still they eventually get him and what they do is awful uh, it's what they would have done to Sherbert um, if, if that mob mentality that's fueled in a lot of respects by violence I mean by sentimentality Avery you were going to say something earlier um, I just thought it was
Yeah, and of course, he doesn't know what he's saying. You know, I mean, killing his own family, killing Tommy Barnes, those are things people say when you're a kid. And I used to go out and pretend to be a soldier and shoot people. You know, I didn't know what I was playing out. I, I admired the courage. I admired the adventure. I didn't know what it meant to die. I didn't even know what that meant. So we can give him a break about that. But you're right. He he, he saw violence as a, he didn't understand it. And I think this, this whole story taught him that. Sarah, and Louise. Uh, kind of going off of that, I thought it was interesting how, like, when he faked his death, he made it, like, as bloody as possible. He could have just had himself, like, drown or something. But right. instead, like, That's a good... he kills an animal so he can drown his blood yeah. and stuff. And it's just he makes it as violent, yeah. although it's pretend violent. Yeah. That's a good point. Josiah. Yeah, well, I talked kind of about what Avery talked about and how, like, he was deeply influenced by violence since his childhood. And most likely he's also because of his abusive father. Yeah. And so the violence that he grew up with influenced the way he acted as a kid, not because he knew really what he was doing, like he said, or what he was talking about. Um, but then I think that's also Quinn's way of, like, being anti-violence since that's the whole reason, one of the whole reasons why of, you know, he's trying to escape, he's trying to escape violence, so. Yeah, and, and, and that whole business about Tom, even Huck, the least violent person in the story beside Jim, he's influenced by the violence he sees around him with that example and with the Tommy Barnes thing, you know, he doesn't understand it, but e even there, Tom, I think, Huck, I mean, Mark Twain is, is criticizing the violent Murray and then... Um, just to talk about the relationship between sentimentality and violence, um, I know it's, like you said, a lot of times one led to the other. Um, I think Tom's sentimentality kind of led him to wish for the violence involved in Jim's escape, like um, how he, well, he kind of wanted to cut his leg off to help yeah. him escape, so right. that was not necessary. And then also the deaths of the people um, led to Emily's uh, sentimentality, which yeah. even though they were, they died like kind of violently, I suppose she had like sentimental feelings about it. So. I mean, she's a sentimentalist, but again, there shows you this the violent society consumes her. Her family consumes her, and she doesn't know. She really doesn't understand violence, I don't think, either. But she, that's what she writes about. That's what she... Uh, think about these real people, like places, excuse me, like Chicago, where there are dozens of people shot every weekend. Um, think of how you... If you, that's what was your life, how you would grow up, you know, thinking violence was a natural part of life. Yes. Um, I was just going to say, I think there was, like, a shift in Hug with his, like... the last thing you said again because I, I just wanted to so uh, just summarize what you said just a minute ago. Um, I just said I thought it was interesting how like Huck's character I think was a big part of why he hated the violence in the other people but it was also like his survival instinct that like he couldn't be caught with yeah. being violent. Yeah and, and sorry I blanked out because in addition to that think about Jim and Huck they don't even have the means of violence. You know, some people have guns. They don't. Some people have authority. They don't. They, any violence that they would perpetrate, like you said, would would come back on them because they don't have any. They don't have any authority. They're at the lowest part of so. You know, in other words, the poorest segment of your any society, they don't even they don't have the opportunity to be violent. 
um, really. They don't they don't have any of the, the tools necessary. And or or so I think all that's really good stuff. Thank you. Um, well, I think we've done the first two, right? Any can anybody add anything else about uh, about that? And, and your I think these discussion uh, just gives me a greater even uh, appreciation of the book because there's so much there. Um, well, uh, how about the third one, whatever that one is? Uh, Maggie, would you mind reading it? The special relationship of human or world is turned upon the multiply. Father tells Bella and the daughter's family how to separate the gems to begin a celebratory relationship. What? Do you mind starting that discussion? Slavery, the institution with Jim, or he makes one exception. Um, yeah, what else do you notice about their change of relationship? Um, I said, like, Jim becomes more of a father figure to Huck because it's like the first time he's experiencing a male figure being huh. so, like, caring for him and not abusing him or anything like his father did. And, like, this relationship kind of helps Huck um, see past Jim Color. Whoever mentioned that yesterday, I don't know if it was Courtney, but uh, who brought that up, I had forgotten completely that. And it's it's perfect because it reinforces the idea that Huck is still a, a product of his culture about racism. But he can't help himself when he gets to know somebody who's of that other culture. He can't help himself but to, in, in his own way, love that man and do everything he can for him. You know, he never, like, he doesn't connect the dots again. He doesn't connect the dots again between the institution and this person um, okay I'm trying to I, there were some other things there other thoughts about that that growth in relationship and, and we might re be in, in, end up repeating some of the same events that happen but oh you mentioned that the father figure it's just such a simple thing sometimes just a statement like that it makes us think and I was thinking of all the books that are about fathers um, even the House of Seven Gables, you know, there was a bad father who started this whole thing. Um, Jack doesn't have a father. Um, this book is about father. You're going to read Death of a Salesman, and they love it, their father, and he's he's a terrible person in a lot of ways. I mean, these these, just, these books break your heart. These stories about uh, that need, that desire that God put in us. Uh, I don't know if any of the writers would say it that way. None of them may even be believers, but we, we see it as that drive for a father and a mother. And the, 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 what both provide for us, um, I mean, for, for every human being. So that's a really, that'd be an interesting overall topic. The, what this book says about fathers is, is a good one. And about, look at, is uh, um, Colonel Granger, is he a good father? And probably some things about him that are good. Um, you know, that's a really good good point. Anything else about the relationship? I just think there it would be important. Yeah, go ahead, and then I'll finish. Um, well, I know it's another important thing. Like, the first time that Huck really, like, really cries, like, he does cry over both, like, he kind of, like, goes past it, like, he mentions it in a sentence, is over Jim, which I think is important because it shows, like, the growth in him. Yeah, when does he do that? When um, he realizes that Jim's been captured. Like, and, um, yeah. Uh, and I would also, that would maybe be the, oh, the culminating point of it. You know, he gets captured twice. He gets captured by the, uh, well, they, they sell him, uh, the king and the duke, and sell him to Aunt Sally. But then he gets captured at the end, um, and they want to hang him because, uh, because of that. Um, I would, I, you can't overlook the tricks. You know, we've mentioned this several times, but just remember the evolution of that from the hat trick the, the trick we took the hat off put on the, the tree to the snake trick to the fog trick and every time there was a different developing reaction I think that, that's very effective in showing how he is growing um, in his relationship to the it's not a trick but one of the ultimate twice he tries to give him up and he can't do it 
the last one, and somebody mentioned this yesterday, he's even willing to go to hell. Talking about your relationship to somebody, Paul said that. <laughs> Paul said that. He said, I'm willing to go to hell for the Jewish people if my going to hell would save them. Um, that's, that's like the ultimate. Isn't that the ultimate uh, sign of love? Is a complete sacrifice. So Huck um, has grown that, that much in the book. Anything else you want to mention about that? Uh, is the next one about the river? I like that one because it's one we haven't talked much about. There's a lot you could do with it. And anybody want to give us some ideas about the, the river? Yeah. I said the barrier kind of acts, or sorry, the river kind of acted like a barrier in the book for the characters. Like um, whenever they wanted to escape, like for example, Huck in the beginning with Jen, they both went to the river. And then the Duke and the King, whenever they want to escape, Yeah, it's it's a it's an escape. You mentioned that it's freedom. It's a barrier. It's a protection. Colin, um, I kind of thought of it as like a backbone for the entire story. As a what? Like a backbone. It held the entire story together. Like, yes. Like, like you said, like that's a lot. Because every time he goes to this place, he is coming down the river and he's stuck in the same town and he leaves on the same river. It's just like held everything together. Yeah. Yeah. I mean it. I, I, I pray, although I've seen it, I, I, we're going to give you some, I still have it over here. Things you can say about the book, yeah, it's just a general uh, list of things um, you can say about a, a character. And one of the things it says is, uh, what would the book be without this character? And, and it's mentioned that, you could say that about anything, a particular symbol, a particular character. I, I don't like it as much because it's easy to say without the character, you wouldn't have this and this happen, just plot wise. Well, I, th I think the best way to look at that is without, like the river does play a role in that plot. And specifically when he, remember he runs out of river. Eventually, it's only so long. I mean, it can't keep going forever. And, um, and, and the problem is they're going in the wrong direction after all. At first they're going in the right direction, going south. But then they go past Cairo and they end up going in the wrong direction. And they have, and some we've mentioned this yesterday, the, um, the, the gains at the beginning of the book with Tom Sawyer are matched by the gains at the end of the book with Jim with Tom Sawyer. Um, and so that you, you could really, I think you could really, at least plot-wise, show how important that river was to the, the structure of the story and how it creates these great ironies, the fact that he's going south that's where he was going to be sold. He's escaping, so he wouldn't go south. And what does he do voluntarily, sort of voluntarily? He's going south. I don't know if you saw the other day, I had some notes up here about naturalism. And we'll get that into that with the next book on Friday. We'll talk about it. But one of the things naturalism believes in is that man is a victim of forces uh, that he has no control over. And I just realized the river thing was like that. Because they, their plan was great, but fog and flood kept them, things they had no control over, it pushed them past the river and kept them going. Of course, if they had gone up the river, it would have also ended the story, too. That they, they could never really get to the Ohio River, because that's, that's a, a solution. They, they don't need a solution if you wanted to write a longer book. Other things, but what about the, I think we may have mentioned this, what are the, the things the river affords them. I mentioned freedom, uh, the plot, but what about practical things that the river does for them? Positive things. I mean, think about their eating. Um, think about the aesthetics of the river. There are more than one occasion, they're, they're lying on their back looking up at the stars. Huck makes some statement about how beautiful the river is. Uh, it's an aesthetically pleasing place. Uh, provides food for them, safety, um, and these other things. But of course, it also, the slave catchers, they were on the river. And the flood about killed them. The fog separated them. The river boat about killed them. So if you balance it out, there might be probably just as many dangers with the river as there are blessings. Um, but those are some other things that you could say about it. What I'd be impressed with for anybody, if you took maybe a topic that didn't look like it could go very far, and you took it far, 
because that sort of okay the teacher is oh I'm surprised I didn't think I didn't think about this so sometimes you don't want to try to outsmart the, the reader like I'm going to tell the reader that I'm you, but you do want to think I don't want to just give give them the same stuff that I know everybody else is giving them and uh, that's why I enjoy these, when these discussions I hear new things or new slants on things that's uh, that's what if possible you want to try to go there with your writing. And then the last one is just growth in general, isn't it? Isn't it? Um, well, how about that? Uh, Clayton, can you, any thoughts about the, the growth? Uh, so still, you can put it in five years of characters, but you put it in the book and it does not have yeah. character effect. And so I just listed uh, Tom Sawyer as bringing out like his immaturity. Immaturity? What did he like about her? I love that that line. I don't know if we mentioned it here. We did in one of the classes. But what, what did he say she had that he really liked? She probably had, you know, a, a pretty girl too. You know that didn't that was, didn't hurt. But um, you know what he said? She's got more sand in her than anybody ever knew. Did you did you understand what he meant by that? She's got a lot of sand in her. She got more sand. I mean, that's what in the world is that about? You have any idea what that means? It, but think about it. It's a metaphor. Uh, so what is sand? Yeah. That's I like that, I, and I think that could be it. But there's also that idea of grit. Have you ever heard that word? Okay, grit meaning there's there's substance to her, and she's got she's got some courage. She's got some endurance. You know, like we used to call it guts. You know, uh, you know, you wouldn't say that in front of women, girls. Uh, intestinal fortitude, that was always the joke. You know, the football player would call guts. But then when your mom's in the room, you say intestinal fortitude. Um, whatever it is now, I don't know what the, the expression is, but um, that's what she has. And so that that impressed me. Um, well, we, we kind of touched on that subject already, but any, any last words? Um, I mean, it's not like I'm giving you a formula. These things must be in your story. That's never the case. But if I'm not seeing anything fresh and new, then you know, you know where I'm coming from. You know, these are the things I would have said. These are the things I would have expected you to talk about. As usual, if you can give examples from the whole book, if you focus on just one part of the book, the reader's going to get the idea that you didn't read the whole book. This is all you know. So if you give examples and make references to the whole book, not everything in the book, but just parts of the whole book, that, um, that lets the reader know you, you know what you're talking about. So I will pick one of those or comment, I don't remember, I might even give you a choice, I've done that before, probably will, um, because you don't know which ones those are. So any last words about that, any last thoughts? I just think it's uh, something worth thinking about in May, too, that you could use this book in a, in a lot of ways. I wanted to end, we hadn't done this in a few days, just a short poem. Um, so if you would, uh, just a, kind of like dessert. I know we just did the main meal, the, the substitute for you. Then you want the dessert. It's the part you've been looking forward to. <laughs>
Anyway, um, I looked up the word frigate. Um, any thoughts about the book? It, I mean, about the, the poem. It's uh, it's a poem about poetry, um, and it, we we said something in the discussion that also made me think of it. Any thoughts? What she's talking about? What is a frigate? Yeah, I just looked it up. It's a warship, and it's very maneuverable. Um, it's smaller than a battleship or one of those types of ships, but it's highly maneuverable, but that's not really why she chose it, I don't think. Uh, so how is, a, uh, how is a book and a frigate like each other? It kind of tells us. Eli. Well, she says that books, uh, like, <clears throat> books take our imagination like, away from, you know, what, like our boring lives or whatever. Like, books take people in the Sure. And that's the theme of the story. So it, it has, uh, it's, uh, remember we always talked about when we wrote our sonnet? Um, like, I don't think many of you have understood the idea of a, like, uh, what did, how do we put it? Um, a uh, pattern, a sonnet, uh, I mean, an image pattern. Well, here's an image pattern. What is that pattern? What do the images have in common? Uh, they have, have things in common at, at several levels. What is? What are the three images in the book. Metaphors, too. There's figures. One is the frigate. What's the other one? The course. What's a courser? So it's a horse. It's a war horse, fast horse. And what's the third one? 
chariot. We know what chariot is. So there's the image pattern. What's the pattern? Yeah, transportation and, and fast. Um, what else is in common with those three words? At least two of the three. I think they all three are, but what do they have in common? Now remember, it's you don't know much about it, but it was 18 Civil War, post Civil War. So um, what, what else are those? They had three forms of transportation. They yeah, they could be used. Uh, they are actually war. Um, are they all like not used anymore? Right. Exactly. Even in even in uh, 1865, 1870, you don't have chariots, um, and they don't call them coursers. Um, they had horses, but but not that. So, um, what does that add to the theme? As we just said, you mentioned earlier, is that this takes your imagination away. What what in addition to those? Three words. Okay. It's saying books are beyond space and beyond time. Yes. Yes. Very good. Um, and then, uh, did, did you notice the punctuation, the form uh, of the, the poem, uh, the maybe the rhythm of the poem? If there is no frigate like a boat to take us lands away, nor any course or like a page. Of prancing poetry, this traverse may make the poorest take without oppression of toll. How frugal is the chariot that bears the human soul? Um, anything, anything about the uh, the rhythm in the, the poem that enhances? That's always something to look at. Remember, part of my job and part of your job is to think. Okay, I've got all these two, all these words. They weren't. They, why do I learn all these words? Because these are tools that. They use, and if you see one, okay, I, I, I'll acknowledge this is the tool. How does the tool contribute to the meaning? So rhythm is always something to consider. Does the rhythm enhance it in any way? Or any course is like a page of prancing poetry. What do you notice about the rhythm there? Come on, horses. Yes. It sounds like I am a king there. Yes. And that a regular gait or a regular gallop or something. You know, that that that's one of the things that goes on. And um, in comparison to these things, and you mentioned it's a it it express it it carries imagination in places that you can't go with normal uh, transportation. What does the last part suggest? Even greater than what we've already mentioned about just your imagination. How does the end of the poem even heighten the value of, of poetry? Not only takes your imagination away, what does it also? Your soul. What does that add to the to her meaning or her message or however you want to put it? The fact that she throws soul in there, what is she saying about poetry? It's not only it doesn't only solely take your mind away, it's it's expressing your mind. It's it, it's maybe even good for the soul. It bears, so it, it has that kind of impact as opposed to even just the imagination and especially just the physical transportation aspect of it. Um, notice several things you can read, just we'll finish here, but this is a great example. Why did she use frigate and not some other? We mentioned that. You know, that's always a way to think. Why did she use this word? What could she have used? Um, and look at her punctuation. Um, I hope this is correctly punctuated because when you get it on the internet, you never know exactly how they might have just accidentally or on purpose have left punctuation out. But she liked dashes. Um, so that, that's something to consider. Do you feel that way about poetry? I would have to say maybe I'm not there quite yet. <laughs> I, love, I, it, I love teaching it. I love reading it. But I don't do it. Like it, when I go home, I don't read poetry. I read, I read novel. I read fiction, um, and I've written some poetry. But uh, I, I also have written some of the other stuff. You know, just for the heck of it. Um, and so I, I guess before I can really appreciate, you know, it is the highest form of literature. 
that's one thing you have to remember over there. It's the, it's the oldest form of literature, the Bible. And I've mentioned this before. In uh, Philippians, is it? Uh, it talks about we are God's workmanship. I think it's Philippians 2.15. Our pastor mentioned it. The word workmanship, thanks to Tim Tebow, I read his one of his books, and um, he pointed out that the word workmanship, the Greek word in the original Greek, is the same word used for the word poem. So it's very, it would be very appropriate to say we are God's poem. And if God sees, it's kind of like poetry is in the Bible, if God sees poetry, you are his poem, and there are a lot of things you can do with that. Because think about what goes into creating a poem. It does reflect the author's heart and mind uh, in a way maybe uh, you know, some engine doesn't. Um, that says a lot about poetry. So tomorrow when you come in, uh, we won't do Emily Dickinson, but we'll do some more for her. She can be quite puzzling sometimes. But we'll write, and I, I thought I might be able to get your poetry papers back to you first. I didn't, but I'll be working those on those. So maybe early next week. I hope to finish them if we can. You can get those papers back. I'll work on them. And just pray that we...